Uhuru. 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 Welcome everybody to the third event of the 200, 2018 Days of Reparations to African People Speaking Tour, um, hosted by the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. My name is Ann Hirsch and I am the Southeast Regional Coordinator for the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. The Uhuru Solidarity Movement is the organization of white people formed by and working under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. The party formed the Solidarity Movement to win white people to work under the leadership of black power, taking up the call for white people to go back into our communities and win other white people like ourselves to take a genuine stance of material solidarity with black self-determination and African liberation. Just a quick announce, a few announcements before we begin. If you will turn off your, or silence your cell phones, we'd appreciate it, so don't interrupt the speakers. Um, we ask that you take no photos or video unless you're authorized by the AV team to do that. Uh, please hold comments and questions until the end, and you'll see inside your um, program, there's a place where you can write notes to yourself so that you'll remember what you wanted to ask about. And your bath, the bathrooms are to your left, so you would go out this door and down the hall, and they're on the right. So before we get into our amazing program tonight, I want to begin by saluting our keynote speaker and the founder and leader of the Hura Movement. It is an incredible honor to have in the room with us tonight, Chairman Omali Ishitela. I also want to salute Deputy Chair Ona Zane Yeshitela, whose leadership over the Black Power Blueprint Project is transforming the conditions of the African community through political and economic empowerment in the hands of the African working class. I'd also like to in, uh, salute Secretary General Godzi Kozo, <laughs> Adjuprof Director Akile Anai. Black Power 96 Station Manager, Diakiese Lungasani. <laughs> APSP Chief of Staff, Akenge Meele. <laughs> Alikia Ningoma from the Office of the Chair, an amazing <laughs> choir director. Um, also, there are a few other uh, members of the party here. David Lance is here. And I want to give a salute and a special welcome to Deanne Lewis, who is the sister of Tyrone Lewis. I want to salute the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, who is the first white person to take up the call from the party to build white solidarity with black power over 42 years ago, Chairwoman Penny Hess. <laughs> and I want to salute the national chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, who ran for mayor of St. Petersburg, along with Akile Anayi for District 6 on the revolutionary platform of unity through reparations, Jesse Neville. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for being here. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> and we want to give a special shout out to Aquaba Hall and to uh, APEDF for allowing us to use this beautiful and historic venue in South St. Petersburg. It is honored to be in this hall tonight, and we thank APEDF -E so much for the opportunity. Let's give a hand for this beautiful building, part of the Black Power Blueprint. When we began this event, we said Uhuru. Uhuru means sweet freedom in Swahili. We are here tonight for the third event of the Worldwide Days of Reparations to African People Tour. 
The tour kicked off in St. Louis, Missouri, went to Huntsville, Alabama. It's here tonight in St. Petersburg, tomorrow in Gainesville, Florida, then Philadelphia, then New York, Boston, Portland, and Seattle, Washington. However, this is not just another day of reparations event. This event here in St. Petersburg is being held on October 24th. This date has special historical significance to the African people of the city and to the world at large. In 1996 on this day, two white cops, James Knight and Sandra Minor, murdered an 18-year-old African named Tyron Lewis. In response, the African working class rose up in a courageous rebellion that shook the foundations of the United States. It was during this time that Chairman Omalia Shetela and the Uhuru Movement led a profound struggle to defend the fam family and legacy of Tyron Lewis against vicious slander by the white media, to demand justice and reparations for his family, and to raise up the just demand for black community economic development as opposed to the colonial public policy of police containment. We want to take this moment to say Uhuru. Uhuru. In honor and unity with the ongoing struggle to win justice for Tyron Lewis, whose name and brutal death at the hands of colonial white power will never be forgotten. It is a name that represents African resistance, and we stand in unconditional solidarity with the right of African people to resist and to fight for their liberation and power. We salute the family of Tyron Lewis at tonight's Day of Reparations, and we will have a statement from Adjuprop Director Akile Anai later in this program tonight. Uhuru. Now, before we bring up our first presenter, we'd like to show a brief video uh, about the project that we are raising resources for tonight, the Black Power Blueprint, which is being coordinated by the amazing Deputy Chair Ona Zene Yeshitela. Excuse us, we're having, a, we're good? Okay. Solidarity Movement team um, is here tonight, and uh, I just want to, are we ready? Okay, um, so I just, uh, if you'll just raise your hand when I call out your name, Tama, um, David, Kever, Johan, who else is here, um, Jackson, and Rose, um, these are the people who have worked um, 
over the last three or four months, letting people know about this event, putting it together, and I just really want to salute these comrades um, for um, all their hard work to make this happen. All right, and now we're ready to go. The Black Power Blueprint is a black-led self-determination project in St. Louis, Missouri by Black Star Industries. We are embarking on an ambitious goal to rebuild our own African community, and we need you on board. With your donations, we are building the Uhuru House Community Center, the One Africa, One Nation Marketplace, and the Community Garden in the historic O'Fallon neighborhood on Goodfellow Boulevard in a once thriving community. We are building the Uhuru Jiko Community Commercial Kitchen, a bakery and cafe, and the training center for the African Independence Workforce Program. The conditions faced by black people in America today demand that we seize the future for our children. The African community in St. Louis, like others around the country, face poverty, joblessness, poor schools, and substandard housing. We see wealth, opportunity, and prosperity on one side of town, contrasted by deep poverty and despair on the other. The Black Power Blueprint will impact on our city through genuine social and economic rebirth for our community, empowering our community with sustainable job creation and commerce, attracting and supporting black culture and arts. Black Star Industries, partnering with the African People's Education and Defense Fund, has built black community-owned and operated institutions of economic development and self-determination for over 35 years. From Oakland to Philadelphia to St. Petersburg, Florida to Huntsville, Alabama, we have sustained community-funded commercial kitchens, a wellness center, furniture and consignment shops, event spaces, and other community-based initiatives and programs. And now, we need your support to realize this visionary project in St. Louis, Missouri. We're talking to owner Zane Isatella, manager of Black Star Industry. Owner, what is your vision for this amazing project that you're for? Well, right now we have community uh, centers in Oakland, California and St. Petersburg, Florida. So we're going to duplicate this same center and make it a rental center for the community. You can have your birthday party here, you can have weddings here, you can have anniversaries here, you can have baby showers, anything that you can imagine, you can have it in this space. As you can see, we're on the major construction and we need major donations to complete the flooring, the carpentry, the HVAC, our stage and our lighting. So what's going to be upstairs? We're going to have offices upstairs. The first office we're going to have, of course, is our nonprofit, which is the African People's Education and Defense Fund. Okay. We're going to have an office for Black Star Industries, as well as the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement National Headquarters Office upstairs as well. Owner Zane, where are we now, and what is your plans for this space? Yes, well, we are right across the street from the new Uhura House, and we really need the donations to really make this um, a reality. What we want to do is we want to demolish both of these commercial properties, clean up this lot. We have a garden on the other side. We want to make a community garden. We also want to make this an event space where we can hold our One Africa, One Nation marketplace so people can come in in the community and create community uh, commerce and economic development for our community. Now we're at the future home of the Uhuru Jiko Kitchen at Goodfellow Boulevard. What is your vision, DC owner, for this space? Okay, first I want to say that Jiko is a Swahili word that means kitchen. So this is going to be a licensed commercial kitchen and cafe and bakery. So we're sitting in this beautiful space where people will be able to come in and purchase the African comfort food as well as our amazing Uhura foods and pies. This is going to serve as our community licensed commercial kitchen where people can come and prepare their food. They have a licensed commercial kitchen or venue for them to be able to jump off and start their own business. In the back of the building, we're gonna house a classroom, 
that's going to be for the African Independence Workforce Program, that's going to be dealing with the mass incarceration of African men and women who come out of prison and really don't have an opportunity to go back into society to work. We're going to be teaching them how to be owners of their own future, how to own their own businesses. We also have a space where we're going to be doing our distribution. And this is where the trucks can actually come into the gate, pull up into our building and drop off all the goods and services that we need to, you know, uh, be able to have our products on site at all times. So another feature of this amazing building is, of course, the outside where we're gonna be doing our own garden, where we're gonna be growing our own food that's gonna be prepared in our own kitchen. And also it's gonna serve as a venue for um, seating. We're gonna have seating on the outside and we're gonna have entertainment. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and I support the Black Power Blueprint. These economic development institutions are critical to Black Power, economic development to the Black community. So I'm calling on you to support these institutions, support the Black Power Blueprint. I was born and raised here in St. Louis. I'm utilizing my skills to create a better future for your children and mine. The plumber's ready to start. The only thing we need is your donations to make this happen. Donate today. Spread the word. Visit our websites for more information and follow us on social media to keep up with the progress of the Black Power Blueprint. for that amazing project. So uh, now I'd like to introduce a powerful performance by the station manager of Black Power 96.3, the Akiese Lingasani. Please welcome him to the stage. Yeah. 
Now I would like to welcome to the stage to salute the struggle for justice for Tyron Lewis, Director of Afri Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, Akile Anayi. First, want to appreciate. Um, it is an honor to be able to speak here today. Um, before I speak, I want to recognize my leadership, Chairman Amalia Shatella, leader and founder of the African People's Socialist Party and the Huru Movement. As well as want to salute, you know, just the African People's Socialist Party and that the, you know, the party just came back from our amazing historic seventh Congress in St. Louis, Missouri. The world is changing, you know, this, there's a shift happening in the world and it's the African working class, it's the vanguard that is paving the way. And just this room being filled today is a prime example of the party, the historic work that we've done. And, you know, just the fact that the course of history is changing in the favor of the African working class. Also want to salute uh, Chairwoman Penny Hess of the African People's Solidarity Committee, who took, who was the first white person in history to take the stance of reparations to African people and become the first white African internationalist and spread it, you know, throughout the white world and has brought all these white people here today. And also uh, chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, Jesse Neville, and um, the whole DREP committee for days and reparations to African people. So just want to salute all of you all. So Uhuru, give yourself a round of applause. And of course, I want to recognize and salute Deanne Lewis, who is the sister of Tyron Lewis and woke up this morning screaming, long live Tyron Lewis. Tyron Lewis! Long live! Tyron Lewis! Long live! And you know, I wanted to you know, be able to well, recognize this sister here and to be able to talk about the history of Tyron Lewis uh, and talk about the history of colonial violence um, that has existed for the last 600 years since you know, African people have come in contact with white people, since the first assault on Africa and African people where we were you know, um, snatched from our land, killed, brutalized, murdered, raped, and then dispersed all around the world to work and make Europe rich, to make this white world rich after they stole and you know, killed the um, indigenous people here on this land. 600 years of colonial violence and just another egregious display of that was October 24th, 1996, right here in the city of St. Pete. And it was, you know, the murder of an 18-year-old African, and you won't hear it anywhere else, or if you do hear it, you'll hear this story told by the bourgeois media, um, how they tell every story about an African that the state murders, that the police murders every single day, exactly what they tell you about all the victims of colonial violence. You know, some way, shape, or form, they justify the deaths of African people. They justify genocide every single day, and that's exactly what happened in the case of Tyron Lewis, and it's the Uhuru movement. It's all always been the Uhuru movement to control that narrative, take it back, and to explain this relationship for what it really is, to expose it for what it really is, which is state violence imposed on the African community in order to sustain a system of genocide, colonialism, and slavery. And so, 
when they murdered Tyron Lewis, this 18-year-old African in 1996. You all may be familiar with what happened in Ferguson in 2014 after they murdered 18-year-old Mike Brown. Well, St. Pete was Ferguson. St. Pete was Ferguson. African people were in the streets in 1996 and led a courageous fight back against the police who, you know, this city deployed 300 police officers, a police helicopter, and they attacked the Uhuru movement and they attacked this building. And on November 13th, they assaulted this building because when they released the verdict, a non-guilty verdict on both those officers who murdered Tyron Lewis, they tried to make it a mission to kill the leaders of this movement right here. They assaulted this building. They put every ounce of tear gas. They tried to murder Chairman Omali Echetela because the Uhuru movement provided the political leadership around that whole rebellion. And the people knew to come out, get organized, and exactly what to do and exactly who the enemy was because of the work that the Uhuru movement had been doing, the political work that the Uhuru movement had been doing, being out here in the streets, being the only means of, you know, having economic development projects in the city, and being visibly fighting for the interests of the African working class community because no one ever does it. No one talks about the African working class. Nobody talks about the brother with his pants sagging. Nobody talks about Tyron Lewis's. It's always been the Uhuru movement and we provided the political leadership in that whole situation. And that's why on that day, you know, African people in this community with everything that we had and we gave it to them, we pushed back 300 police officers, shot down a police helicopter, put out those fires and, had, and they had to say, Pull all the troops back, we are under heavy fire. And that was this movement. And before that, it was 1966, where chairman was already priming the city of St. Pete for black power and revolution right here. In 1966, where chairman tore down this white nationalist mural that hung in city hall, all the way up until 1966. And you know, if you've never heard about it, it was this huge mural. If you go to City Hall today, you'll see it. When you walk up those steps, there's one mural on the left and it's a blank wall on the right. It's eerily blank because Chairman Amali Echetela tore it down. The first black power act in the world was led by Chairman Amali Echetela and it set the precedent for what happened in 1996 and it set the precedent for what's happening right now in this room where white people are coming to the conclusions that African and colonized people have come to a long time ago. That this system has to go, and the system will go. That the peoples of the world will no longer suffer the same conditions that it has had to for the past 600 years. That Africa and African people will be free in the, in the colony of St. Petersburg, Florida, and throughout the world. And white people have the ability to get on the side, the right side of history, on the right side of the question, so that there no longer has to be Tyron Lewis's. There no longer has to be, you know, Markel McCullough's, and you know, all these Africans that have been murdered in this city, and all Africans who are being murdered on a daily basis under this social system of imperialism, colonialism, parasitic capitalism, it's going, it's going to be overturned, and this is the ability to get on the right side of history. The cha Chairman Amali Echetela opened this door, solved the question of white people in the world, and this is where you belong if you intend to see the fall of imperialism and join with the side of humanity and join with the side of colonized and oppressed peoples. So, you know, again, I really want to appreciate um, being up here and I want everybody to really remember this day, remember how significant it is and never to let October 24th go by, never to let November 13th go by without recognizing those historical dates in history. That's a part of our history, our legacy, what we will talk about in the future in a free liberated Africa and a free liberated world. We'll talk about the rebellions of 1996 that led to the revolution. We'll talk about the rebellions of 1996 that led to the overthrow of imperialism. We'll talk about those those courageous Africans. We'll talk about our African martyrs like Tyron Lewis. They will forever be remembered. This is a day in our history. Bump all those colonial holidays and the colonial ho history that you are supposed to celebrate and that are imposed on you. This is a day in history for us, for revolutionaries, for those who intend to see the system die. And we have a responsibility to remember all of them and to not just remember them, but to fight for them. Because Tyron Lewis did not die in vain. Those mothers, this sister, this family did not mourn in vain. They will be avenged with the overthrow of imperialism. Uhuru, unity through! Thank you so much, Uhuru.
Uhuru. Long live Tyron Lewis. Reparations now. now. Reparations now. now. One more time, reparations now. <laughs> now is an honor to welcome the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, Penny Hess, has been a member of the African People's Solidarity Committee since its founding in 1976, working under the party's leadership to carry out Chairman Amalia Shetela's brilliant scientific strategy of organizing members of the colonizer settler nation to break our allegiance to imperialism and to unite in principled, principled material solidarity with the African Revolution. Penny Hess was the first white person to become a revolutionary African internationalist by joining APSC and taking up the call to build the movement for white reparations to African people. Chairwoman Penny speaks and organizes throughout the US and Europe to educate white people about the history of colonialism and slavery and that we have historically benefited from and participated in and how we can be a part of rectifying our relationship to the rest of humanity. She is the author of the incredible book called Overturning the Culture of Violence, written under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. Welcome to Chairwoman Penny Hess. Unity through? Yeah. Reparations, reparations, yeah. now. Uhuru, I just really want to salute this event tonight, and I want to salute everybody who came out to the Day of Reparations to African People, our event here in St. Petersburg, Florida. We just returned from St. Louis, where we had the day, our first Day of Reparations to African People, and then we went to Huntsville, Alabama, where there was an incredible event there as well. We are here tonight, tomorrow we will be in Gainesville, Florida, and then we will be in Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Boston, Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. And this is sponsored by the Uhuru Solidarity Movement and the African People's Solidarity Committee, the organizations of white people under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party and Chairman Omalia Shetela. So I just want to say that this is very historic. I really, I really uh, salute all of you who have come out tonight. I salute the comrades from the Uhura Solidarity Movement that, ha that were put forward before who were out there on tables, talking to people, knocking on doors here in St. Petersburg and other places around the country, bringing out the reality that all white people sit on the pedestal of the oppression of African people, all white people owe reparations to African people. And this is the future for, for us. And we're gonna talk about that quite a bit tonight. I do want to salute that video in the Black Power Blueprint, this incredible Black Power program of the African People's Socialist Party that is taking place and being carried out in St. Louis right now. It's really powerful. You can go to uh, blackpowerblueprint.org and find out a lot more about it. It's, it's an amazing program that just um, raised a 25-foot flagpole with a 25-foot square, I guess, or 25-foot African red, black, and green flag in the middle of the north side of St. Louis, which is incredibly impoverished and impressed neighborhood. So we want to salute that and Deputy Chair Ona Zene Ishitela, who's been on the ground there for over a year building that program uh, under the leadership of Chairman Omali Ishitela. I want to salute Chairman Omali Ishitela tonight and I want to say some things about this whole, uh, some of what uh, Director Akile Anai just talked about and the significance of the struggle that was led by the chairman around in, in resistance to this murder, this police murder of Tyron Lewis um, 22 years ago, and the significance of that, and, and why um, we must salute the chairman, Chairman O'Malley Shetela, for that. 
I want to salute the African People's Socialist Party and the powerful 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party, a week-long event that was just a couple of weeks ago in St. Louis as well that um, brought together African people and allies and solidarity members from all around the world to plan to adopt the political report of Chairman O'Malley Chatella to report on their work to, to really um, you know, showcase the fact that the African People's Socialist Party is fighting for the complete and total liberation of all African people everywhere on the planet to liberate Africa, all its stolen resources, and African people everywhere and all 12 million square miles, this is 12 million or 12,000, 12 million square miles of the continent of Africa, which is the birthright of African people everywhere, and to, to show that every place that African people are, they are oppressed, they are colonized, they are impoverished, and that Africa belongs to African people. The value of the stolen labor of African people must be returned in the form of reparations to African people and all of the stolen resources that are being plundered from the continent of Africa must be returned to African people. That makes sense. That just makes sense because Africa under nominal independence is still being looted every day and still putting the benefits of Afri stolen African labor and resources into the hands of white people all around the world, whether in Europe, whether here, whether on the continent of Africa. Africa must be free, and the African People's Socialist Party and Chairman O'Malley Chatella is absolutely determined that Africa will be free and that every African person on this planet will be free. And that is a future that I want to see, and I salute Chairman O'Malley Chatella for leading that. And, you know, the day of reparations to African people, again, in, in actually 42 years ago, 20 years before the police murder of Tyron Lewis, here in this city, I happened to be there when Chairman O'Malley Chatella and the, and the African People's Socialist Party held the founding conference of the African People's Solidarity Committee, this experiment, this um, controversial plan to organize white people under the leadership of the African Revolution with the mandate to go into the white community to actually be part of the strategy for African liberation to bring the voice of black power into the white household, into our own neighborhoods, into uh, the white communities all over this country and all over the world to be able to win other white people like ourselves away from our historic unity with this vicious system of parasitic capitalism, of white power um, that has given us life at the expense of the tremendous suffering of African people and all oppressed and colonized peoples on this planet, that world is changing forever. And that this organization gives us, us as white people, an ability to be part of a future in which all human beings can live, nobody at the expense of anybody else. And, um, you know, I, I just, I salute, by the way, Jesse Neville, chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, who along with Akile Anai um, ran for office, Jesse ran for mayor on the platform Unity Through Reparations and um, for, for mayor last year here in St. Petersburg and kicked ass the ruling class and won so many white people just going door to door to really um, be profoundly moved and have their lives changed by this stand of unity through reparations as a political campaign here in the city. And he ran along with, under the leadership of Chairman O'Malley Ishitela and Akile Anayi, who ran for District 6 City Council, who on the uh, platform for Radical Times, Radical Solutions here in District, District 6. And it was just something that turned the city right side up. And it was very, very powerful. I salute that and the tremendous work of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement under the leadership of Jesse Neville. Um, and, you know, I, I just, um, I want to salute the chairman tonight because 
the chairman, as has been said, Chairman O'Malley Shatella, is upheld and loved and highly revered by many in the city for tearing down that hideous um, caricature of, of a mural that had hung in City Hall for like 30 years, since the 1930s, prior to um, the 1968 when he did that. And that, as has been said, the city, the city government has never been able to replace that mural with something else. They're always trying to. They have their little schemes now and then to come before city council and try to put up some other hideous thing. But it's ne they've never been able to do it because of the resistance of the community and the African community here. So, you know, it, there, are, there are a lot of people who, when they, when they want to talk about, um, you know, the African resistance and the, the movement for African liberation, they go back to the 60s. They talk about the Black Panthers. They talk about um, maybe Huey Newton. And they were great shining stars of their period. But we have to understand that that was 60 years ago. That was 60 years ago and that the, um, you know, that actually the Black Panther Party, as the chairman has shown, existed for four years, for four years, between 1966 and 1970 um, was the height of its, you know, of its influence. And before it was attacked by a counterinsurgency um, that was led by the U.S. government against it, and we know about that because the U.S. government, and often it's called COINTELPRO, that assassinated Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Fred Hampton, who was a leader of the Black Panther Party in Chicago, one of the great leaders, and many others. And there's many African people like Sundiata Okoli and others who from that period are still in prison today. But Chairman O'Malley Ishtetela is the leader of today because he survived that period. He survived the 1960s. He summed up he looked at the devastation of what four years earlier had been the most profound movement inside the borders of the United States that's ever existed. In a period, as the chairman always says, when revolution was the main trend in this whole world, when the Vietnamese workers and peasants were kicking the ass of France and then the US, when people were winning and this whole question of anti-colonial struggle was considered to be the defining question of, of the whole period, of that era. And um, Chairman O'Malley Shatella was born then, he struggled then, and he faced what he could sum up, what only the chairman could sum up as counterinsurgency against the African Revolution because you know, the leaders of the African Revolution, Huey, Newton, and other people were hosted and um, welcomed by the leaders of Vietnam and by the leaders of China and all the revolutionary forces because they recognized that inside the borders of the U.S., even as the U.S. was fighting the people of Vietnam and had another front, and that was inside the borders of the U.S. So the U.S. was very, very clear that if they stopped, if they defeated, if they assaulted and attacked the African liberation movement of the 1960s, that they were going to go a long way in destroying the consciousness and the struggle and the organizations for revolution and anti-colonial liberation all around the world. That's how important it was. And so many others were, were murdered from that period, were in prison, or, or step down and, and cease to struggle, in some cases even betraying the movement or going towards um, neo-colonialism, going towards the Democratic Party or other ways that, you know, that, that did not benefit the liberation of African people. But only the chairman, only Chairman O'Malley Shetela summed up that what happened was a counterinsurgency. And that is so critical because most people were like, well, what happened? You know, all these people were killed and then the struggle was, was silent. The struggle was silent. If you lived through that period, you know, a lot of white people were galvanized by the struggle of African people. And we, 
you know, might have been against the U.S. war, we didn't take a stand, we didn't go into the white communities as we were called on to do by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to organize other white people to take a stand in solidarity with African liberation, we didn't do that. Um, and as soon as the, the gun started, you know, being waged towards Fred Hampton and other leaders of the Black Panther Party, most white people, you know, left and went, as the chairman says, went back to college and took a bath and cut their hair and became lawyers and other kinds of things because we could step up, back up again, onto the pedestal of the oppression of African people. So the chairman summed up that there was a counterinsurgency. He saw this destruction and that, that this war against the African movement of the 1960s was defeated also because the US began to in, impose deadly drugs, chemical warfare, heroin and later crack cocaine into the African community, into the African working class, going step by step, you know, day by day throughout the United States, flooding the drugs into the African community and at the same time criminalizing the African working class that only a few years before had upheld the moral compass of the entire world that, would, that had revolutionary morality, that, that told and showed the world how to struggle and what the system was really about inside the US that exposed it to its very marrow. And now suddenly, African working, the African working class are the criminals, are criminalized with drugs imposed and as the chairman says, an entire, all, any colonial economy that existed, like the gas plant here in St. Petersburg, was taken away to build this, this dome and was wiped out so that, and this happened all over the country, the same thing in African communities, in urban areas, the, the, um, the local economy, the colonial economy was taken away, was destroyed, and the only thing that remained in the African community was the drug economy. Was, that's the only thing that would put food on the table. That's the only thing. And, and as the U.S. began to um, build massive prisons and stuffing African people into those prisons. So it was the responsibility that the chairman, Chairman Omali, took upon himself to say that he made a commitment to complete the African revolution of the 1960s. He made that personal commitment. And in order to do that, he had to solve every problem because his goal was to make sure that the next time, the next time that African people rose up and took on this fight against the US imperialism that they would win that they would win. And that was, is what the chairman has been doing for the last 60 years. And nobody has done that. Nobody else has done that. So the chairman, I don't have a lot of time. I just want to say that the chairman created a political analysis not based on some theoretical uh, book that he read, although he did read many books of Marx and Lenin, but through his experience growing up as part of the African working class to answer the questions, how did the world get to be this way? Why are African people catching hell everywhere they are and why are white people doing okay everywhere they are, are doing well, prospering? Why is this? And the chairman, you know, unveiled, unearthed the history, which we can't even deny that this system and this country is built on the enslavement of African people, on the assault on Africa by Europe, which stole African human beings that set out in this human trafficking, if you want to say where that started with, that started with the assault and kidnapping of African people. That was the human trafficking whose wealth built the US economy built the stock markets of, of Amsterdam and London and United States, New York, built the wealth and, the, and, and the, the theft of the labor of African people, turning them into human machines for the benefit of 
this white power system. There wouldn't be an America, as the chairman said, and there wouldn't be capitalism without the enslavement of African people, without the theft of this land and the genocide of the indigenous people, and the oppression and colonization of the majority of the people on the planet Earth. That is the answer, that capitalism is parasitic, it was born parasitic, it was never benign, it never had a good time, it never had a time when it was okay. From the very beginning, the presidents were slave owners, owned African people, they participated and, and uh, instigated the genocide against the indigenous people, and white people came here from Europe, poor and impoverished, and had our opportunity, our land of opportunity, as we call the United States, to step on the backs of African people, be part of, to be the state, the white people's state, as the chairman calls it. So before there were the police, and before there were the, um, you know, the military and the prisons, there was us. There was us, who were the slave catchers, who were um, the slave owners, and owned African people, and who carried out the lynchings and reign of terror against African people that nobody, no white person ever paid a price for that. I just went to the other day, Jesse and I were coming back from Huntsville, and we went to the first ever lynching museum in Montgomery, Alabama. And this, the African People's Socialist Party, if they did a museum like that, it would be way better. But nevertheless, it was deeply, 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 overwhelmingly, you know, it, it I, I mean, I don't even have words for it. I don't have words for it. If you have a chance to go to that and to see it and to see that this is a country built on that and that all of us from the white community, that's what our grandparents and our great grandparents were part of, you know, that's what this is about tonight. We are taking responsibility for that, for the fact that as the, you know, the chairman has shown this, this can't be denied, read your history. And that this whole question of the social wealth that we have, even if we do have oppression, even if we are women, even if we are LGBT, even if we are workers, we are all of those things on the backs of African people and we've always worked to solve our problems while continuing to step on the necks of African people. This is, this is the reality. This is our truth and we have to tell this and this is not a feel good thing. This is not a struggle against racism. It's not about the ideas in our heads. This is a call for white people to stand in solidarity with an anti-colonial struggle that is fighting for the liberation of Africa, Africa and African people. It is fighting for territory. It is fighting for their land. It is fighting for their resources and an economy. It's not an idea. And that's what's so important about Chairman O'Malley and Chatella because when in 1996, Tyrone Lewis was murdered and an African is murdered every 18 hours in this country. But what is memorable is that the chairman made sure that this city and this country would never forget Tyron Lewis, that he, his name would be forever tied to the struggle for liberation of African people, and that it goes towards the entire movement. It moves it forward till the day that African people are free and liberated. It is, was a revolutionary struggle and it happened right here and it was led by Chairman O'Malley Chattel. There's a lot more that we could say and I appreciate that, um, that Director Akile had said that. I just, you know, I just wanna say that there's a lot of white people who are in despair. They call it the deaths of despair. All these white people are dying, committing suicide, o ODing on drugs, um, dying of, of alcoholism in this country, so much so that the life expectancy for the first time of white people is declining. And, you know, as long as we're tied to this system, whether liberal or Democrat, as long as we're tied to this, our lives on this pedestal, we're going to be in despair because people around the world are resisting. They want to bring U.S. imperialism down. They stand in solidarity with African people and that there's no, there is no future. There's no future if we look at America, but there is a future 
if we look at the ability to go inside the belly of the beast to return the stolen resources and therefore be part of a world that African liberation represents the end of all oppression, the end of all oppression of every kind, that this is the world that we can live in. And when you look at the crisis of imperialism, you can look at right now, you know, the U.S. is, is killing and starving the people of Yemen. They're saying half that population is going to die within the next few weeks of starvation because of what the U.S. backed Saudi Arabia is doing. You know, you can look at all these people coming to fight to try to get in here to get their stolen resources coming from the southern border. They're going to fight for that. And we can look at the conditions of African people that are worse, worse than they were in the 60s in terms of poverty, in terms of one, the fact that one out of every eight prisoners in the entire world is an African inside this country, that we look at this and the only future is the future for imperialism to go. It's got to go. There is no compromise with that. And the future of the red, black, and green flag flying over not only St. Louis, but this world and Africa, that is the future in which all human beings can live, in which the world can prosper, which all of the contradictions from climate change to poverty to hunger all of these problems we solve not by this system built on genocide, slavery, rape, and pillage, but based on a world led by the African working class, a world that embraces all humanity and lets us, for the first time, find our humanity, find our humanity through the stand of reparations to African people. So, you know, I just want to call on all the white people, the North Americans who are here tonight to to join this movement. This is the only place to be. This is the winning side. And it feels so good to be on the winning side. It feels so good to be on the winning side. <laughs> the losing US in no way. You know, this is, this is the side of history to be on. And we have a responsibility. We can't leave this world for another generation. We have to make it, you know, we have, it has to go. It has to go. And we can only do that through the leadership of the African working class and the African revolution. So, you know, I just really want to thank everybody who's here tonight. I want to salute Chairman O'Malley Chatel again and to say that we are winning. The African People's Socialist Party is winning. This is a future that I'm inviting you to be part of and unity through <laughs> reparations. Uhuru. <laughs> Um, thank you, Chairwoman Penny. Um, you know, she is the person who made the space for all of us to be here, so let's give her a hand. And she continues to show us how to uh, be in um, principled um, solidarity with the African nation. Um, now, I would like for everyone please to stand and welcome our keynote speaker. It is my profound honor to introduce this speaker to the stage tonight, the revolutionary leader without whose vision, theoretical worldview, and strategy to win revolution in his lifetime, none of us would be here today. It is this leader who single-handedly led the struggle to complete the black revolution of the 60s in the aftermath of the US government's brutal counterinsurgency war to crush the righteous struggle of African people for their liberation and self-determination. For 60 years, this brilliant African revolutionary leader has rebuilt from the ashes of defeat a global revolutionary movement of African workers uniting as one nation in a unified strategy to liberate their Africa and Africa's resources as the birthright of every African person on the planet. It is this leader who just presided over the momentous 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party in St. Louis that brought together revolutionary cadre forces of the African liberation struggle to unite around the next five years of advancing the movement for freedom, for African freedom. 
founder and leader of the Ahura movement, who provides leadership for the entire world and for the entire world's revolutionary struggle, the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. Please welcome Chairman Omali Shetela. Uhuru. Uhuru. I want to thank uh, Comrade Ann for the introduction. And um, I want to um, also express my appreciation to the Uhuru Solidarity Movement uh, for um, initiating this meeting and uh, on today. That's a part of a series of meetings that we'll be having around the country, as you've already heard. And I want to express my appreciation to you uh, for coming out on today. Uh, is that the lovely child that I... <laughs> I um, also, I, I, I want to, she hates this, uh, but I would really like for Deanne Lewis to, to come up just a minute. I want you to, to see her and... Uh, This, this is the sister of Tyron Lewis, who would have been 40 years old today. They killed him when he was 18. I wanted her to stand here uh, because too often when these crimes, these offenses are made against our community and people die and, and the stories are made up, fabricated, and what you will see in the, in the newspaper after every murder is a picture, a photo, a mugshot uh, that is used to justify murdering. This was an 18-year-old child that they killed. He, was, he still had baby fat in his face. And uh, they concocted a story about him having stolen a car and that crack cocaine was in the car and that he had tried to run over uh, the cops who killed him. It was, a, it was an absolute fabrication. And they knew it, the state knew it, the bourgeois media knew it. And in fact, on the year, first year anniversary of his death, uh, the St. Petersburg Times ran a length, lengthy article uh, telling how the James Knight, who had killed Tyrone Lewis, who had fired the, the weapons, uh, the fired the round that killed him, uh, obviously lied. They told how he had claimed he would hit by the car with such force that it knocked him on the top of the hood. And uh, the Times ran an article saying the guy had on short pants and that they took photos right after. There was no, not a bruise on his, on his legs at all and that uh, there was no fingerprints of him on the hood of the car, just on the front of the car standing there. So they murdered him and uh, it was state murder. It was collaborative, it was something that the, the the ruling class media here uh, collaborated with, but that should be expected. I mean, we're talking about a newspaper that used to be called the St. Petersburg Times, uh, where one of the owners of the St. Petersburg Times actually participated in a lynching in this city, what was that, 19, what, 20, 1914. And then the owner, the owner and almost half the, or maybe, what, Three quarters of the white population participated in killing an African right here in this city. So that's the history, that's the tradition. And I just wanted you to be able uh, to meet Deanne Lewis. She calls me her, her she calls me her godfather. <laughs> but she never kissed a ring. <laughs> Thank you, Dia. Thank you so much. Yeah. The discussion that we're having now, the comments that you've heard up to now, uh, the discussion around, around reparations may be one that falls uh, harshly uh, on the ears of some people who are here. And if that's the case, it's only because the United States government succeeded in murdering uh, the people who led an incredibly powerful movement, the 1960s, for the liberation of our people. You know about 
some of them. You know about King. You know about Malcolm X. You may not know that in 1968 alone, they killed more than 30 members of the Black Panther Party. And by that time, they had arrested more than 300 members of the Black Panther Party. But it was a movement that was silenced. And it, when I talk about this era of, of brutality that we experienced as a movement, I, I want to remind you that uh, it was during a period that was characterized as one time when revolution was the main trend in the entire world, the 1960s, which meant that the majority of the people on the planet Earth were fighting to be free from European American colonial domination. Everybody on Earth was struggling to get out of this stuff. It was happening in Vietnam. Uh, it was happening throughout South America. Uh, it was happening all over Africa and it was happening in St. Petersburg, Florida as well. It was a, it was a huge movement. And uh, uh, it was a movement that ultimately was crushed. People were murdered. It was crushed in, in the more vicious way. Uh, not only uh, did they kill people like King, they killed 17-year-old Bobby Hutton, who was a young member of the Black Panther Party uh, in Oakland, California. They killed Fred Hampton, who was only 21 years old in Chicago, when they, after having used an agent to put drugs in his Kool-Aid to make sure that he was helpless in his bed when they crashed in at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, they murdered him in his bed. They, his wife, who was then uh, something like eight and a half months pregnant in the bed with him, uh, recalls that she could feel the mattress vibrating when they shot through the wall because they had this agent uh, who had drawn a floor plan to show where everybody was and where everybody sleep, slept. So they didn't even have to walk, come into the room. They shot through the walls, and she said she could literally feel the mattress vibrating as, as the gun, as the, as the, Bullets, you know, went into it while she was in bed with him. So it was a brutal, murderous thing. And, uh, uh, and they, it was part of what we've identified as counterinsurgency. And counterinsurgency, you may have heard something about it when they talk about how they're going into uh, Iraq or they went into Afghanistan to engage in counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency uh, is, a, is a, a method of warfare that, uh, that that deploys, that employs all kinds of, of, of operations. It's psychological warfare. It's economic warfare. Uh, it's uh, political warfare. And the basic foundation is, is, of course, the gun. It's military. And this is something that was launched against us all around the world. People who were fighting to be free. I'm talking about people who some people have good memories of, that heroic persons. You can't, you go back and say what it was that they stood for. So what did they stand for? What did Che Guevara stand for when they came to Bolivia, when he was in Bolivia? He had been to Africa, he had been to Cuba, trying to launch movements that would liberate people. What did he stand for so that when they wounded and captured him, that they murdered him? What did, what did he stand for? Was he robbing banks? Was he uh, taxing the poor? Was he giving all the resources to the rich? What did King stand for? That he had to die the way he did, and of course Malcolm X and Patrice Lumumba in Congo, and Kwame Nkrumah in East Africa, in West Africa rather. These were, these were figures who simply were struggling to win freedom, happiness for our people. And they were killed. The United States government did it. The United States government did it. And it was a part of a counterinsurgency. And when they killed the revolutionary leaders, they replaced the revolutionary leaders with people who are commonly called sellouts and neo-colonial forces. And they took revolution off the agenda. They raised an entire, more than two generations of forces who would represent the interests of white power in our community as opposed to our power. Think about this. There's an election happening in a few days, and people are very excited about it because there's a possibility there might be a black governor of the plantation. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but think about this. 
There was a time when a, a serious movement was happening in this country. King was talking about poor people's march and a poor people's campaign to raise up the impoverished people in this country. Malcolm X uh, was talking about a revolution of Black Panther Party, 10-point program. JOMO, the organization that we built here, have revolutionary programs. And so what you saw was it was only 1965 before universal suffrage occurred in this country, before everybody had a right to vote. That's when the Voting Rights Act was passed, 1965. But look at the period of murder and the assault on the revolution in this country. Right at that period of time, they were killing off revolution. They were killing Malcolm, killing King. Uh, killing revolutionaries all around this country, killing Panthers, etc. And then after they kill the revolutionaries, kill the programs that the revolutionaries stood for, then they say, you got a right to vote. You can vote now. But you had nothing to vote for. You had nobody to vote for. Your party has been destroyed. Now the only thing you got is a Democratic Party, which, by the way, at that same time was the party of George Wallace, who was a rabbit frothing at the mouth white nationalist in Alabama. So this is, this is what, what we were left with. And then, of course, they silenced the revolutionaries. They terrorized people. There are people still in prison, as was said, from that moment. Uh, there are people who uh, were murdered. Uh, I mentioned Panthers. The co-founder of the African People's Socialist Party uh, was one of them. I was in and out of jail so often I had to read the newspapers to locate where I was. That's how serious it, it was during this period of time. So they crushed the revolution. Nobody's talking about revolution. Everybody was coming up with a reason why you should sell out. Everybody's saying what you really need to know how to play the game. You see, you just didn't know how to play the game. And anybody who's ever played a game knows the house always wins. You know, the house always wins. You, you never win uh, like that. And, of course, it wasn't a game. And lives were at stake, oppressed peoples around the world, and we still haven't escaped that situation. Not only African people here, but oppressed people around. Just mentioned, thousands of people are dying daily in Yemen. The people who are dying right now in Iraq, Afghanistan. I don't want to hear anything about a terrorist in Afghanistan. I mean, uh, the issue is that they are now living under military occupation. It's a U.S. white nationalist occupation in Afghanistan. What gives the United States the right to invade that country and take it over? Or Iraq? Or any other place on the planet Earth? So, I just think it's really important, you know, I want to contextualize some of this because the reason, if this sounds, if it's falling on ears with some kind of alarm, it's because the revolution has been quieted for a very long time. You haven't had an opportunity to hear it. It's one of the reasons some time ago, uh, after the defeat of the revolution, I'm talking about more than two gener generations, more than two generations we've gone without African people being having access to the revolution. Best you can get is a news reel flick of the Black Panther Party or something like that. Uh, so, talking about solving the problems of the revolution, the white people have been the greatest problem we've had of the revolutionary movement. That's been the fundamental contradiction because we've always had to fight in isolation. Yes, I know there were six white people who died over here. I'm talking about in general, the white people have been the ones opposed to revolution. I'm talking about the same people who are now uh, given Trump a 41 or 47 percent uh, poll rating today and, and, and precisely because of what he stands for. You know what Trump stands for. They know what Trump stands for. Uh, and so that's been a real contradiction. And our struggle gets isolated. We talk about the murder of people like Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton is 21 years when, when on December 29th, 1969, 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, with the assistance of the FBI, the Chicago Police Department shot their way into the home and murdered him and Mark Clark. Um, uh, and then, uh, where was the white movement? Where was the white movement in 1996, 97, November of uh, 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 96, when, when more than 300 police 
attacked this building right here, attacked this building with cops from all over the, this area and, from, and state troopers. And they said, while well, they did it, they said they didn't want us to say anything about the verdict that the decision that the grand jury had made not to indict the murderers of 18-year-old Tyron Lewis. This is why you couldn't hear from us. 300 cops. They used every bit of tear gas in the city of St. Petersburg, all the tear gas they had in their arsenal. They set houses on fire. They tried to set this building on fire when they did it. This is the, the reality. So we said we need to, uh, and there was no, where, where were the, the ACLU, the, the, the constitutionalists, the liberals, where the hell were you? The free speech persons, you, weren't, you were not to be found. And so what it meant is that our struggle was constantly being isolated. So we, we are trying to make this struggle. There was an attack, Jesse will tell you about this when uh, I've forgotten the year, it wasn't that long ago when uh, they said this youngster who had just turned 16 had killed a white cop. And, and <laughs> they had the Homeland Security. They had uh, all kinds of cops. They didn't even know who it was they were looking for. Think about this. They didn't even know who they were looking for. They stopped every car coming into the African community. They stopped buses and, and boarded the buses. They stopped taxi cabs and looked in their trunks and what have you. And they had tanks in the city. And, and there were white people saying, there no, that's a lie. There are no tanks in the city. Don't tell me there were no tanks in this damn city. There were tanks, you know, in this community. They went door to door. They did door to door searches, not even knowing who the hell they were looking for. So it wasn't about finding somebody who was terrorizing this community. They told people, you can't come out in your yards in this city. And so you have white people who can be oblivious to this stuff. And they, who are, they will tell you, uh, if they killed him, he must have done something. This is a common refrain that we hear from the white community because there is a different reality that white people experience in this country. So the solidarity movement. was directed to organize what we first characterized as African People Solidarity Day, to take this out to the white community, to white people, have white people come to be able to express solidarity with African people in this country, and did it for many, many, many years. And it was a difficult struggle just in terms of getting white people to go out. I'm talking about white people who shout to the skies how much they love peace and nonviolence and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but they would, never, they would never come out. They're in this city now, they won't come out to a day in solidarity. They won't come out day in reparation. They will not bring their little lily white asses out. You know? You know? And uh, so, so that's what we've begun. But something has changed now in the world. And what has changed, obviously, in the world is that this whole social system is experiencing a severe crisis that is visible to everybody, even though we are getting different kinds of narratives about what is the basis of the crisis and even what the crisis is. But it's clear that we're looking at a state of crisis. Trump is an example of the crisis himself. He's a manifestation of the crisis himself. And, and uh, this, we're living in a period of uh, permanent warfare. Been now fighting in Afghanistan, killing in Afghanistan, occupying Af what, 17 years now. That is incredible. And they can't stop making war. They have to make war. And even as they're doing all of this, they're destroying the very earth that we stand on. And so, uh, Either people are uh, faced with dying as a consequence of the brutality and, 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 and vicious oppression that, the whole, that most of us are experiencing, or as a consequence of an attack on the very environment, a profit-motivated, profit-based attack on life itself for the entire planet. 
But I want to just say something because I don't want to be heard as just somebody who is ranting and in many ways saying some of the obvious. Uh, I think that it's really important for us to have an understanding of the basis of what it is that we're looking at. Uh, and that's why I'm saying that I don't give a damn about race or racism, uh, who likes me uh, or not. It's not even about that. It's not even about that. Uh, uh, we live under colonial domination. And uh, when you're talking about colon colonialism, you're talking about the question of power. Who has power over our lives? How did we lose power as African people over our lives? What the hell happened that we no longer have power over our lives? Why is it that every place you look on the planet Earth, not just here uh, on the south side of St. Petersburg, that they have now characterized Midtown or what have you, but any place on the planet, you see Africans are without power over our own lives. And of course, the explanation given to us by our oppressors and the ones who run the world is that there has to be some kind of moral or intellectual deficit on the part of African people, which explains why we don't have power. But I want to say that in truth, white people are relatively new to civilization. And Africans have amazing civilization before white people mastered fire. That's just an objective truth. I mean, you can even find that in the local library if you search hard enough or Google it, <laughs> if you will. Um, and uh, when we met white people, not just Africans, but most of the other peoples in the world, when we met white people, we met people who lived under feudal domination in Europe, under severe poverty and desperation, who were the next closest thing to slaves. And in fact, in some places around the world, for almost a thousand years, we are talking about this feudalism. Uh, in some places around the world, it was literally true that white people were the corner phrase, naked and afraid. Sometimes didn't even have clothing. This is not slanderous. This is true. And, and so when we met Europeans, uh, it was Europe that was poor. Between the few years, four years, 1347, 1352, half the white people on the planet Earth died. Between the period of 1347 and 1352, half the white people on the planet Earth died. A plague. And you cannot lose half a population in four short years and have anything that approximates a viable economic life. And then after that, four years, you're still talking about another 50, 100 years of that and other plagues still impacting Europe in a very serious way. So how did, how did this change? And of course, what changed it uh, in part was the, the slave trade and colonialism. Europe rescued itself from disease, from poverty, from oppression through the slave trade and through colonialism. I said Europe did that, but Europe didn't do that because there was no such thing as Europe. What there was that was recognized by, by some people uh, uh, in this area uh, that now constitute what we refer to as Europe is this group of warring tribes constantly fighting and warring with each other. And it was, it, who define themselves primarily in relationship to each other. You know, you, you had what? The Goths and you had uh, the Normans and the Celts and all these different people who were constantly, there was no Europe. What, what gave them a sense of sameness and created what we now call Europe was slavery. So that when it began the slave trade and colonialism, now these folk began to define themselves not primarily in relationship to each other, but primarily in relationship to us. This is what created the white man. 
This is what created the European. Uh, because now this entity is being defined in relationship to the rest of us. And this process of slavery, Karl Marx talks about capitalism having come about as a consequence first of the slave trade, which was, and this is really important to understand, the slave trade, uh, which created for the first time uh, a, a world economy. Not just that people traded with each other, but world trade. They used to call it things like the triangle of trade, triangle trade, the world trade, hooked the world up in a single entity, which was incredibly significant for the advent of capitalism as a world social system. And then uh, he talked about how uh, uh, in order for there to be what they call capitalist production, there had to first be capitalist accumulation. But how do you get capitalist accumulation without capitalist production? He said that you uh, locked into uh, this vicious uh, cycle unless you can understand or be able to conceive of a, a, an accumulation of capital that was not a consequence of capitalist production, but a starting point. And this starting point, this accumulation of capital that he talked about was turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. He talked about it interring the indigenous people in this land in the mines, bringing up gold and silver that went to Europe and the rest of that. He talked about it being part of the war that was made against China, 1841 and 42, uh, the so-called opium war that turned China into a nation of junkies and what have you. In other words, uh, Jesus did not bring capitalism. You understand? Uh, uh, he, he, it came as a consequence of the rape and pillage of the rest of the world. So you have this world now consolidated like this. Identity is consolidated like this. And the ones with the power are the ones who control and own the slaves and the economy born of this slave. That's who sets up the schools, the institution that teaches everything, everybody everything they know. That's the one that would not allow any kind of defiance. No kind of defiance. What do you mean? So you, you can see the pictures of people who've been lynched and murdered. I, when I was growing up, I literally thought that, that some Africans I, I knew, I would see older African people and they look deformed, physically deformed to me. And they look deformed because a slave who is, can be murdered and brutalized at a whim, at a, at a whim, they, have, <laughs> they learn how to act in the most servile way that they, you can't ever see any defiance in the eyes of this person. You head down. You're in a permanent state of genuflection when you are dealing with white people. Uh, and this is how a nation that's oppressed and brutalized by slavery and colonialism learns to function. And now what happens is the ones who owns the slave master, the oppressor, begins to really believe that's who that person is. Begins to really believe that, but I ain't never been who we are. Never been who we are, and there's never been a time where we did not resist, uh, even if it didn't look like it, you understand? So, so what's been happening is that there's been crisis after crisis after crisis, and now it's a crisis that's more or less become generalized where the peoples around the world are taking back their resources, fighting for their resources. When they fight for their resources, it causes a, an economic crisis. That means there's a, the pie is, getting, is shrinking. So you see greater competition between the rulers of the world. You see a greater desperation in the United States where the United States, and Trump didn't invent this, you saw that with Bush says that we're running everything, we're taking everything, not only from the Africans, not only from the people in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf, but we're taking it from the other white people too. And so uh, now the question of trade, free, you know, you hear Trump talking about disrupting all of the trade relationships. It's a touchy question today. Who's going to get the loot? 
You see, the question of immigrants is such an important question today. Who are the damn immigrants? The people who's been pushed out of their lands, out of their countries by capitalism and white power all around the world, they're coming to get back. Even if they're not conscious, that's what they're doing. They're following their own resources. So they can't stop the war. They can't, the police can't stop killing African people. Tyrone Lewis was killed. That was 22 years ago. But almost every week you look and you see another killing, another killing, another killing by a white cop, white people, period. Happening on a regular basis. They can't stop it. If they could, they wouldn't do it. And the reason they wouldn't do it because it always creates up, uh, unrest among their slaves. So if they could stop it, they'd stop it, but they can't stop it. That's the nature of this beast that we're dealing with, this social system. I want to say this and get out your way. Capitalism is an evil entity. It's, it's a horrible entity. It's horrible. And, and it has to be destroyed. It's got to, it's a cancer on the human, it's a cancer on humanity. It has to be destroyed. And most people recognize that. Most people know that capitalism is characterized by at least three features. One is based on, on private ownership of the means of production, right? And uh, even though you have socialized production, as I say, people have to collectively do the producing, you got private ownership. And the people who own it don't do any producing. Uh, so you got people who come together to make a car and can't afford to buy a damn car. People who don't make cars, they own the damn cars, right? So they know about that. People, capitalism, they will, you know, people will readily talk to you about how capitalism uh, is based on commodity production, which means that things are not produced because people need them. Things are produced for profit. That's why you can't get no health care. I don't give a damn if it's Obama's health care, Trump's health care. Ain't no damn health care in this country. Ain't no health care. You can't have health care under capitalism because under capitalism, what they call health care is for profit. It's more profitable for you to have cancer and to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back than to cure it. That's what capitalism does. There's no health care here. They tell you that capitalism is based on, on, on wage uh, labor. And, and, and this is a really important thing because this is the question where they talk about how exploitation happens at the point of production. Because a person never gets paid for what she is, what she produces, she get, gets paid for her ability to produce, and that's different. Because if you make tables and you get paid for what you will produce, you get paid the value of the table. You don't get paid the value of the table. You get paid enough to get enough food, clothing, and housing for you to come back and make more tables. You get paid for your ability to labor, not for what you have produced. You understand what I'm saying? That's how the thing works. They can tell you that. But the missing ingredient is that all of this that we are talking about, all of this capitalism rests upon this foundation, this mysterious foundation that Karl Marx referred to as the primitive accumulation of capital that came about not as a consequence of capitalist production, but actually was a starting point. And that's the enslavement of most of the world that's not white, and of slavery and colonialism. That's where it started. And that's why you see such crisis today, because people everywhere are fighting to take back their stuff. And that's why we shouldn't be depressed. I'm telling you, don't let Trump oppress you. I'm telling you, let, let Trump oppress them. You understand? He is the one that causes depression for the ruling class, even as he's shoveling money and money and money at them. He is mobilizing masses of, he's mobilizing more oppressed people around the world than Che Guevara. <laughs> with, with his activities. And increasingly, that's what you see. And I'm, you see that we're doing work in, in St. Louis as an example have an incredible movement in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, it's just so striking that everywhere we go, at St. Louis, we got work in what they call South Africa. We have party in South Africa, incredible movement, young African people who are organizing under the banner of the African People's Socialist Party and African, Socialist, African internationalism. 
We got organization in Kenya, in East Africa. We got organization in Sierra Leone, in West Africa. We got organization in London or England. We got organization in France. We got some organization in Belgium, et cetera, and in the Caribbean. It's an international revolution. Capitalism is an international manifestation. It's not just something that exists uh, on, in Midtown. Uh, it's not something that's affecting us, gentrifying, you know, all taking, pushing the African community here. It's a, it's a vicious social system that's worldwide, and we have to have a worldwide response to it. I, I'm saying that they are locked in a very desperate situation, and I am so glad to see you here, because if you look at what's happening in the world, you can see white people being made extremely desperate. Penny Hess, chairwoman Penny Hess talked about the spike in African and, and white deaths. It's, it's extraordinary. Suicides, uh, alcoholism, drug addiction, etc. It's what? The disease of despair? And that's how they're calling it. But hell, we've been in despair for I don't know how long, but they never call it that. They call it, <laughs> they call it the reason to have the helicopters fly over and have the, the, to be locked up. Our children are in these jails right now. If there's not an African in this room to, right now, at this very moment, who doesn't have, know somebody who's in prison, Perhaps been to some, some of you, if you don't know somebody, been to prison, got a relative in prison, been to prison, on the way to prison uh, with some kind of relationship. That's our lives. Yeah. And that's not acceptable. And it shouldn't be acceptable to any of us. Yeah. And I want to say that when I'm, we're having this discussion, we're talking about the emancipation of people, of the toiling masses of the whole world. What I'm identifying is that the strategic location for that struggle is in the African Revolution. Yeah. I'm not a Dr. King, turn the other cheek, we shall overcome kind of person. <laughs> never have been, never will be. I'm not a sympathetic character, I know that. I'm not looking for sympathy. What I need is solidarity. Yeah. And I'm... I'm And I don't mean any more solidarity than we've ever shown to anybody. The people in this room can testify. We, it, we demonstrated solidarity with the people of Palestine, even at a time where the moderate Palestinians didn't want to be able to struggle. We demonstrated solidarity with the people of Iran. And when they took that nest of spies in 1979, when the Iranians took over that, we had, and, and white people in this country were running around sometimes killing people who Arabs, because they didn't know the difference in an Iranian and an Arab. Uh, and then, you know, on the university, one of the premier schools in the state of Florida, the college kids uh, were out, you know, having bonfires and chanting, sand niggers go home or send the Klan to Iran. This is what they were doing. This party led a demonstration to thousands of flag waving, frothing at the mouth, white people who were chanting America and America and America. And this part, and, and got physically attacked the first time and did it again in solidarity with the people of Iran and the Iranians who were catching hell here. When, when the people in Nicaragua uh, uh, made a move to try and take their freedom back from this uh, U.S. supported dictator, uh, Somoza, this party turned over all the resources that we had to the Nicaraguan revolution because we were in solidarity with the people to win their freedom from imperialism because we knew that a victory for them was a victory for us. This is our history. So I'm not talking about some, you know, just some uh, narrow nationalist expression. We are African internationalists. But we understand that the critical thing that's going to destroy capitalism and lead to a new world is the liberation of African people, which is global. Because we are everywhere. Africans are everywhere. Sometimes laboring on the false national consciousness. So we call ourselves Jamaicans. We call ourselves Haitians. We call ourselves Ghanaians. We call ourselves Congolese. We call ourselves Afro-Americans. We call ourselves Black Brits. We call ourselves Afro-French, Afro-Swedes. We call ourselves Afro-Colombians. All these other names. And uh, there are places, and they, they are, there's a false national consciousness. You cannot get on a boat in Africa in 1619 or earlier as an African and then get off in Jamestown, Virginia as a Negro. Okay. 
If we were Africans when we got on that damn boat, we were Africans when we got off that boat. You understand? And that's really crucial. It's really critical for us to understand that. We got African people who live in places like Cameroon. Uh, they call it Cameroon. Who call it Cameroon? The Portuguese call it Cameroon. Why they call it Cameroon? That's in West Africa. They call it Cameroon because they found a lot of shrimp there. And the word Cameroon comes from the Portuguese word for shrimp. So you got a lot of Africans running around calling themselves shrimp, but they're not shrimp, damn it, any more than I'm an Afro-American. You can't be an African and an American at the same time. That's a contradiction in terms. And there are other stories. I mean, you look at a place like, uh, like Nigeria that was dominated by the British, still is in many ways, the British and Americans now. And uh, what we see is that, that uh, uh, there was a man named Frederick Lugard, who really is the architect of neocolonialism. And he, uh, neocolonialism, which is indirect rule. And Lugard had been preaching indirect rule. Listen, we don't have to have the normal colonialism where the white man stands over. We, have, we create indirect rule. We pick Negroes. We pick Africans to run it for us. And so he was sent to these territories, one of two of the territories, contiguous territories that was controlled by England at a time where this barren rock that calls, that's called England controlled 25% of the world's population and 25% of the Earth's territory. And he was sent there to create, turn it into a, a, an administrative hole. And with him was, uh, was the woman he was to marry. And her name was Flora, what was it? Shaw. Shaw. And he was looking for a name for the place. And she came up with the idea of calling it nigger area. And that's where Nigeria comes from. These proud, noble Negroes, uh, that's where it comes from. This is how we've been named. This is how my father didn't even know his damn name and had the name of a, a white man who, a vicious pig who owned him as property and handed that name down to me. Part of the first act of decolonization was shedding that name. I am not Joe Waller. Shed that name. I'm an African. My name is Omali Ishatella. And I approve this message. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just saying that this is an extraordinary important time and none of us should despair. This is our time if we take it. You're just ahead of the curve, a little bit. You're just ahead of the curve. Others are gonna be with you, I'm telling you. Uh, they're gonna be with you because people are trying to find a way. That's why they went to Trump. Many of them went to Trump uh, because they, people are tired of this mealy mouth BS that they get from the traditional politician. That's why they went first to Obama because they thought they had something there. And then they go to Trump. And that's why they went to Bernie Sanders, who will give you $15 an hour over a number of years, as he calls it socialism. Uh, uh, and so, <laughs> so, but people are looking for real solutions. And, and, and Trump is not going to work. It's not, I'm telling you, it's not going to work. I'm telling you, not only is it not going to work, all of this stuff they're talking about, this great economy, you'll see how great this economy is. It, could, it can't stand a hiccup. It can't stand a cold, not less the flu. If anything comes through, this economy is going down the drain because the people, it depends on being able to continue to steal the labor from the oppressed peoples around the world. So let's go ahead and build this movement. And I want to thank you so much for listening to me, and uh, uh, I want to express appreciation to uh, Uhuru Solidarity Movement and to African People's Solidarity Committee and all of you who've come out. You should join this movement, uh, and you should help to build the Black Power Blueprint. That's one aspect of it, but we're building it everywhere we are located. 
We're not looking for charity. We, we, the question is being able to acquire economic development you know, for our people, for the entire African nation. This is your movement. I'm very glad you came tonight. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman. Now I'd like to introduce our final speaker, who will be presenting on the work of USM and how everyone here can get involved and contribute. Jesse Neville is a member of the African People's Solidarity Committee. He is also the national chair of the APSC's mass organization, the Huru Solidarity Movement. As the chair of USM, Jesse organizes white people throughout the country to work under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party and to raise resources for black liberation and self-determination as a concrete expression of white reparations to African people. Please welcome Jesse to the stage. Oh, for real. Unity through. Tyrone Lewis, long live. Tyrone Lewis, long live. Uhuru. Let's give another round of applause to that spectacular presentation from Chairman Amalia Shatella, our keynote speaker. Thank you so much to the chairman. That was amazing. I've had the honor to be on this tour and to have seen the great presentations at, in St. Louis and to see the chairman here, that was just amazing. And I just appreciate so much the leadership of Chairman Amali Shatella and the African People's Socialist Party, under whose incredible leadership we have the honor to work in the African People's Solidarity Committee and Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And I also want to salute Deputy Chair Onazane Yeshatella. Uhuru to Deputy Chair Onazane. <laughs> and the amazing work of the Black Power Blueprint, which we are building this tour in the context of the Black Power Blueprint. And we're raising reparations, and also known as money. We're raising money for the Black Power Blueprint tonight. So we're going to talk about that, and we're actually going to do that in just a moment. But before we do that, I also want to salute um, Chairwoman Penny Hess and the African People's Solidarity Committee. And a special salute to Deanne Lewis and the family of Tyrone Lewis and the ongoing struggle for justice for Tyrone Lewis and for the African community in this city and throughout the world. Uhuru. So we were gonna show a video, but for the sake of time, I'm actually gonna skip that. I'm very sorry, but it, it's something people should see and it will be online on uhurusolidarity.org and our YouTube channel so people should check it out. But for the sake of time, because we do have discussion, nobody's leaving, right? Everyone's st sticking around, okay, good. So we, we are gonna have discussion. We want to hear your, um, questions and comments, and we also have, you know, just more in this program tonight. So please stay where you are, and what we want to do now is talk about what it means when we say reparations to the black community. And we are not just talking tonight about reparations, we are actually going to engage in the act of reparations to African people. That's why these events are called Days of Reparations to African People. So first of all, I want to say that um, I have the honor of being the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, which is the mass organization of the African People's Solidarity Committee. And if you are a white person who's in this room and you are not a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, you should become one before you leave tonight. And I want to tell you why. Because the African People's Solidarity Committee, under the leadership of the party, built the Uhuru Solidarity Movement in order to deepen its presence within the white oppressor society to build a mass, widespread, popular movement in the white community calling for and materializing reparations to African people. And it was formed for white people to take responsibility for our past and present reality as parasites on the body of humanity and because our only future is in solidarity with African liberation. And I wanted to mention quickly that um, Chairwoman Penny mentioned that after the event in Huntsville, we stopped in Montgomery and we went to the lynching museum. And there's just a lot to say about that, and it is hard to put it into words. For one, 
the idea of a museum, because a museum is, and a memorial is to recognize something that happened in the past, but the lynchings of African people did not end in the 1940s, it just changed form. And this museum in Montgomery, the way it works is there's a museum and then there's a memorial that you take a shuttle to see. And the way the memorial is structured is that it's this outdoor area where there's this huge edifice that you walk through, and it's very quiet. And there are stone structures hanging from the ceiling that look sort of like coffins, like caskets, hanging from the ceiling, like the bodies of African human beings would hang from trees and bridges after a lynching by a white mob. And they're hanging from the ceiling, and on each one is the name of a city or a town in the United States, and, and the, the county, and the names, if the, if the names were documented, of Africans who were lynched, and the dates. And you walk through it, and then you turn another corner, and it continues. And you turn another corner, and it continues. And there are thousands. And according to the, this organization that put this together, they documented 4,400, at least, lynchings that took place between 1880 and 1940. And even they acknowledge that that is a very conservative estimate. That it, in their own words, it is dramatically higher. And we were looking through those stone structures and we walked past and looked at the one that said Pinellas County. Pinellas County. And one of the names written on there was John Evans, who was mentioned earlier. John Evans, who in 1914 was arrested by the St. Petersburg police for allegedly killing a white real estate developer, which frankly would have been a heroic act of resistance if that was true. The, an early fight back against gentrification. And he was put in a, in a jail cell, and then he was broken out of the jail cell by a white mob of over 2,000 people, at least. And that included white men, women, and children. And it didn't include just any white men, women, and children. It included the, the guy, uh, Straub, who has a park named after him. Straub Park. It included uh, the founders of the St. Petersburg Times. It included high-ranking people from the city. And John Evans was hanged from a light post, and while he was still alive, dying in his last moments, a white woman pulled a gun out of her purse and shot him, and hundreds of people, including children, pulled out guns and, and shot him hundreds of times. So that's, that's the legacy of even in this city, in the city of St. Petersburg, of white terror carried out not just by the police, but by ordinary white people that we carried that out, we did that. And there were all these examples in the lynching museum. In this town, a, this African man was lynched. And very, very common thing was that they were lynched because a white woman claimed that they looked at them the wrong way or something like that. And it would say, then 3,000 white people came out. 15,000 in one town. 15,000 white people participated in this lynch mob. 15,000, that's like the entire town. So it wasn't just like a group of you know, southern racist cracker, whatever the stereotype, that went out in hoods in the middle of the night and did this. It was just regular white society that built itself off of violence against African people. And if you imagine, if that lynching museum was to include the lynchings of African people that have taken place in state-sanctioned executions by the so-called the death penalty, or at the hands of the police. Imagine if there was a, a stone casket hanging for every single African who died on the, the so-called Middle Passage, being brought to this continent on slave ships, or every African that was murdered by the police in this country, including Tyrone Lewis, it would go on forever. It would fill up the entire continent. And, but of course there's not. But there are almost as many museums for the Holocaust, the so-called Holocaust that happened in Germany, in Europe, for crimes against Jewish people. 
And that's because there is a recognition of a crime that was committed by the German government against the Jewish people. But there's not even a recognition of any crime that was committed against African people in this country. So reparations is about money, but it's not just about money. It's also about acknowledging and taking responsibility for our legacy that's not something in the past. It's not something in the past. It's in the room with us right now. It's part of our reality to this day. So I just wanted to start off with that. And also just appreciate the incredible presentations tonight and especially to salute again the memory of Tyrone Lewis. And as the chairman said, if Tyrone Lewis had not been killed 22 years ago, he would be 40 years old today. He would be a father. He had a son. He would be a father. And that his life was stolen because of a system that fuels our lives. There's a relationship between every white birthday and every funeral in the African community. There's a relationship. One happens at the expense of the other. So for us to say long live Tyrone Lewis and to honor the memory of Tyrone Lewis means to, re to renew our commitment to reparations to African people. So let's talk about the Uhura Solidarity Movement. The Uhura Solidarity Movement is the organization of white people that go into the white community, and many members in here do that all the time. Go into college campuses, go into cafes, go into yoga studios, go into nightclubs, go anywhere white people are. What, where was it? Uh, a crab festival or something that comrades were at, anywhere where white people gather, okay, we're there. And we're there with the Burning Spear newspaper, we're there with clipboards, and we're there because of a strategy of Chairman Amalia Shatella to extend the African Revolution into the slave master's house, into the slave master's society, into the slave master's living room and Thanksgiving dinner. We're there, black power in white face. The African Revolution in white face is there amongst the white population winning white people to take the right stand. That's the strategy of the African People's Socialist Party. And we have three principles of unity. One, we're under the leadership of the party, period. Non-negotiable, not up for debate. Two, we organize in the white community for reparations to African people, meaning we do not go into the black community or Mexican communities or other communities as the white saviors that are there to try to lead other oppressed people. No, we are under the leadership of the oppressed and we are going back to take responsibility for our own oppressor nation population and win other white people to reparations to African people. And three, we stand in solidarity with, the Afri with African people's right to lead their own struggle for self-determination and national liberation. And this year, in the revolutionary context of the Black Power Blueprint, we're seeing the Uhuru Solidarity Movement growing throughout this country. This is on the ascendancy. White power is on the downfall because of the resistance of oppressed people, and the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, white solidarity with black power is on the rise. It's on the ascendancy. We are actually experiencing and seeing a culture of reparations to African people. Not just a handful of people, but a culture. White people all over the country who are holding fundraisers, who are having meetings, who are holding events, who are creating a new culture that revolves around reparations to African people, that are interrupting a 600-year legacy of the culture of violence and white terror with the revolutionary culture of reparations to African people. And it's a very beautiful thing to be a part of. It's a hopeful thing. The African Revolution coming into the white society is not something for us to fear, it's something for us to celebrate. It's our salvation. It's our redemption as human beings. And it's, it's a culture of life and hope and struggle as opposed to the white imperialist culture of death and denial and hopelessness. And it is for us. Reparations is not a favor. Reparations is not charity. Reparations is not something we do so we can feel like we're the good white people. No, reparations is for us because reparations makes it possible for us to end, as the chairman says, our self-imposed voluntary exile from the rest of the human family. We can finally come into the human family on principled terms because of this beautiful and brilliant strategy of the African People's Socialist Party. And reparations is also our fight back against the white ruling class that we hate, that we despise, and which we refuse to allow to use us as cannon fodder or its lynch mob any longer. That's what reparations represents. It is our weapon. So it's not just something to add to your bullet points on the list of things that make you progressive. It should be number one. 
Reparations should be our main commitment in life if we consider ourselves progressive. So finally, what I wanna say is that the chairman talks about this, the atmosphere of the world today that we're living in, basically like the chairman says, the end times for imperialism. Imperialism is dying, white power is dying. America, Europe, all these things, it's, it's, on, the, it's on the descent. Which is why if you look at the popular culture, this is what the chairman Omali Shatella has pointed out. You see basically the psyche of white power. So you can look at Hollywood, and Hollywood has this obsession with the past when things were hunky-dory and uh, you know, Superman and Iron Man and think, you know, imperial, the empire was strong. Or you see the imagination of, of uh, white power trying to imagine the future, and you see the walking dead, zombies, or vampires. You see death, death, death. That's all you see because they can't see any future. What, and that's true, white power cannot see a future. So, except we can see a future if we are under the leadership of the African Revolution. And the future is not to be found in some opportunist attempt to prolong the lifespan of this social system. That's not where the future is. The future is in the struggle of the colonized, African and oppressed peoples of the world, and in their righteous struggle to destroy this social system, to completely and irreversibly destroy it. And we can be part of that world, but we have to do our part to bring it into existence. That's the essence of the call for white solidarity with black power. And it's already happening. We are a movement on the rise of white people who will not be complicit and opportunistically allow ourselves to be led astray by the next fake protest movement concocted by the Democratic Party. We are white solidarity with black power. And this year, we are holding these days of reparations to African people in nine cities, plus two special viewing party events, one is, which is happening in Perth, Australia, the first ever day of reparations to African people in Australia. So uhuru to that. <laughs> USM's work revolves around material solidarity with African liberation. And this year, in the context of the Black Power Blueprint campaign, we are raising a $100,000 towards the Black Power Blueprint, towards the Uhuru Movement, and we are on track to raise that. This event tonight is actually part of meeting that goal. We are building the Uhuru Solidarity Movement in cities throughout the United States and other places, including here in St. Petersburg, in Gainesville, in Asheville, North Carolina, in Orlando, where there are people here tonight from Orlando, in Seattle, in Portland, in Oakland, in um, Philadelphia, in New York, in Boston, and in many other places throughout this country. This movement is on the rise, this movement is winning, and if you're here tonight and you are a member, you're on the winning team, and you will be on the winning team as soon as you join if you're not a member yet. So we have major goals for this upcoming year. We are committed to build the Uhuru Solidarity Movement in all over the world, including in South Africa, where many white colonial settlers have placed ourselves. We want to build the Uhuru Solidarity Movement there, in Australia, in Israel, occupied Palestine, or anywhere else white settlers have gone to colonize and steal other people's land. So that's what this is about. That's what the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is about. And we want to raise resources tonight. And if you came to this event, um, we, we really ask that all of us, we dig deep to make our goal tonight of building, of raising reparations to African people that goes directly towards the projects and programs that we saw at the beginning of tonight's event, the Black Power Blueprint in St. Louis, that's actively transforming the world. And unlike many organizations that are out there that say, oh, donate money, you have no idea where the money goes, you're actually like surrounded by it right now. You're in an example of where the money goes in being in this Uhuru house. And if you wanna see specifically where the fundraising goes tonight, the reparations, you can go to St. Louis and see it and touch it. The beautiful Aquaba Hall, the Uhuru House in St. Louis, or the place where the African Independence Workforce Program will exist, Uhuru Jiko, and these other amazing programs that are happening. So I would like to call up uh, Comrade Jackson Hollingsworth, who is a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement here in St. Petersburg, to talk about what is our goal and how everyone here can be a part of making that goal a reality. Uhuru. Uhuru. <laughs> yes, thank you, Chair Jesse, uh, for that um, you know, powerful presentation and your introduction. Um, so I want to first say, unity through. 
Reparations. Reparations? Now. So to pay reparations today, you'll notice that there are splendid volunteers who are standing up, um, Rose Roby and Tama Gadini, who are getting their baskets. And um, so they are, will be coming around with their baskets, which will have uh, envelopes with pledge cards and pens in them, so you can make a pledge today of reparations. So, let me move this over here and have our lovely slideshow. There we are. So as you know, this is Days of Reparations, African people. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right, and one after that. So there are many ways to pay reparations, and this is where, uh, in part, is going to a liberated future. Um, so you can become a sustaining member of USM today. Um, that's one way. And uh, the amount will be withdrawn from your account every month. And you can, uh, or you can pay the whole amount today, and that helps sustain the organization. Um, two, you can upgrade your membership if you were already a member. And um, next slide, please. There we are. Um, or you can become a general member for just 25 a year, or if you're a student or fixed income level, for $10 a year. Or you can make a one-time donation. So, next slide, please. Um, you can become a sustainer today and make a one-time donation as well. Um, so just make sure that the total amount is written where it says my total donation is. So you want to know, you know exactly what you are contributing to and we can thank you for your amount. Uh, there are different payment methods. You can uh, make a check to UHURU -U and put in the envelope with your donor card. Uh, please make sure to fill out your info on there. Um, you can uh, donate anonymously, anonymously as well. Um, but we do want to, you know, thank you for your contribution. Um, or you can put cash directly into the envelope with your donor card that has your information. Um, or if you are paying with a credit or debit card, uh, you can see uh, Kever or Tama will also eventually be at the membership table with the USM banner. Kever, can you wave your hand? That's Kever from Orlando. Uh -huh. um, and so... Um, after this workshop, before you leave today, if you're paying with card, please visit Kever or Tama at that table um, so we can uh, receive your donation to, for reparations. So um, also, if you are paying online, uh, if you're tuning into the live stream, go to uhurusolidary.org and click on Pay Reparations. So uh, no matter what you do, please fill out your card. Like I said, we want to be able to thank you. Um, you can donate anonymously as well. Um, so now uh, that you have or are, will be getting your pledge cards soon, uh, we call on you to become a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Uh, make that pledge today. Uh, make reparations a reality to build the Black Power Blueprint and all of the party's programs in every place where they are building their own independent economy in the hands of the African working class. So um, our goal is $14.2 trillion. Next slide. So $14.2 trillion is what um, has been calculated to be um, uh, due to African people for unpaid, uh, unpaid um, <laughs> labor uh, alone uh, during chattel slavery. Um, so we are um, only calling for 2000 I just wanted to add that, you know, we put that slide in there, but that 14.2 trillion and then some will be paid to African yeah. people. Because as Chairman Amali Shatella has said, this social, because by the, 14.2 trillion is the gross domestic product of the U.S. economy. So that's the entire economy. So when people ask, well, how much is owed to African people? Well, for unpaid labor alone, all of it, every single dollar circulating in the U.S. economy. And... As Chairman Amali Shatella has said, capitalism, imperialism will not survive a successful struggle for reparations to African people. So this is a revolutionary act when we pay reparations to the African People's Socialist Party. For real. 
Uh -huh. Thank you, Chair Jesse. Yes, for unpaid labor during chattel slavery alone, not counting everything going on still today. Um, and so we are calling for $2,000 tonight. Uh, so I want to ask who can do the full $2,000 today? And if you're watching online, feel free to comment so we can announce that as well. Um, and this is, you know, not a joke. We are serious that, you know, we are serious about raising this tonight. Um, and also that, you know, we recognize that we as white people have access to the stolen resources of African people. You know, so many of us have, you know, all kinds of access. Um, and so, um, so as I said, our goal is only 2,000. Um, which, as was mentioned, was just the beginning. And so, um, as mentioned, you can also become a member today. So, next slide. We have our membership levels, uh, starting with the Ella Baker level at 100 a month or 1,200 a year. And uh, Ella Baker famously said, uh, remember, we are fighting for the freedom of the human spirit, a larger freedom that encompasses all mankind. So I want to ask, uh, who can become an Ella Baker level sustainer today? 100 a month. You can also fill out uh, your donor card anonymously, just so you know. Um, so next slide. Uh, there is the Marcus Garvey level. At 60 a month or 720 a year, uh, Marcus Garvey more than anyone advanced the understanding of the existence of African people as a dispersed nation uh, to be liberated from imperialism and served by their own all African government. He believed in economic self-reliance and today Black Star Industries uh, of the African People's Socialist Party is named after his shipping line. Uh, his call to action was always Africa for Africans, those at home and those abroad. So I want to ask who can become a Marcus Garvey level sustainer today? All right, keep thinking about it. Next slide. And this is Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, this level is at $40 a month or $480 a year. She worked with the Student Nonviolent Coordin Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, to organize the 1964 Freedom Summer um, African American quote unquote voter registration drive in her native Mississippi and said, action, self-reliance, the vision of self and the future have been the only means by which the oppressed have seen and realized the light of their own freedom. So who wants to become a Fannie Lou Hamer level sustainer today? All right, next slide. And of course, Malcolm X at 30 a month or 360 a year, a great African patriot and freedom fighter. Uh, Malcolm X was an African internationalist who realized that the problems of African people oppressed in different parts of the world are connected. He was assassinated by the US government because of his profound ability to mobilize the masses against oppression. Uh, he is quoted, I'm for truth no matter who tells it, I'm for justice no matter who it's for or against. So I want to ask, who wants to become a Malcolm X level sustainer today? Uhuru. Uhuru, can you uh, say your name to the life? Uhuru, Sarah. Uhuru. Uhuru, Sarah. Anyone else from Malcolm X level sustainer? 30 a month. That's a dollar a month. Dollar a day. That's what I meant. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next slide. Um, there is also uh, the um, there is also the Katuri Katuri Carey level sustainer, uh, who is a uh, co-founder of the African People's Socialist Party uh, for 25 a month or 300 a year. Um, so I want to ask, who wants to become a Katuri Kara Katura Carey level sustainer at 25 a month? Uh -huh. You can also upgrade if you're already a member. Um, Oh, I do want to say, so uh, Katura Carey was one of the co-founders of the African People's Socialist Party, as I said, um, and in honor of this brave freedom fighter and founder of the Vanguard Party, um, you know, we had this uh, level named for her. Um, and now this is Queen Nzinga um, at 20 a month or 240 a year. And she was an incredible military leader in um, what is now called Angola, uh, who led anti-colonial resistance to defeat Portugal. In honor of Queen Nzinga, who wants to become a member at $20 a month? Uhuru! 
And can you say your name for the live stream, please? Uhuru Tamagadini, Uhuru, Uhuru. Anyone else for Queen and Zynga, level $20 a month? Uhuru. Um, and then we have the Huey P. Newton level at 15 a month, or 180 a year. Uh, he was the co-founder and minister of defense of the Black Panther Party. Uh, he um, has been photographed with Chairman Omali Yeshitela, who um, he gave his last speeches at the Oakland Uhuru House and announced he would spend more time there, uh, but was murdered in the thick of the U.S counterinsurgency war against the black revolution of the 60s. Uh, many people here who read the, the Burning, who have read the Burning Spear newspaper, which you can purchase at the membership table as well, um, uh, already know this quote from Huey P. Newton. You might not have the Black Panther Party, but you have the, the, um, the Uhuru House. You might not have the Black Panther newspaper, but you have the Burning Spear. So they really haven't done anything by crushing one organization. So I want to ask, who can become a Huey P. Newton level sustainer at 15 a month? Uhuru. Uhuru. And can you say your name for the live stream, please? Uhuru Rose Roby. Uhuru. Anyone else for 15 a month at the Huey P. Newton level? Uhuru. Next slide, please. And here we have Che Guevara level at $10 a month or $120 a year, our most popular level. Uh, Fidel Castro's best general who fought for the Cuban Revolution and also fought in solidarity with anti-colonial struggles in Africa. Who wants to become, um, oh, I do want to read this quote, um, the true revolutionary is guided by a great feeling of love, uh, love for the people, love for the revolution. And so um, in honor of this, at $10 a month, who wants to become a Che level sustainer? Uhuru. Uhuru. And can you say your, your name for the live stream, please? Uhuru Jenna. And we have another hand here. Uhuru. Uhuru. And can you at 200 lump sum and who can and uh, can you say your name for the live stream please? Your, can you say your name please? Dorothy. Uhuru Dorothy. Uhuru. And uh, anything on the live stream? All right. Um Uhuru. Uhuru, we have a pledge to upgrade to Che Level Sustainer by November. Can you say your name for the live stream, please? Yeah, Johan Bedingfield. Johan Bedingfield, Uhuru. And we also, um, previously I had a pledge from Kafira Baron, who is in Miami, to upgrade to a Che Level Sustainer as well. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uh, anyone else at the Che Level? Uhuru. All right. And so, um, next slide. Uh, lastly, we have the uh, Steve Biko level, um, an Afghan martyr, a socialist activist at the forefront of a grassroots anti-apartheid campaign known as the Black Consciousness consciousness movement during the late 1960s and 1970s, who once said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Who wants to become a Biko level sustainer at uh, $5 a month? Going once, going twice? No, you can keep going. All right. $5 a month. Uhuru. So, um, excellent uh, for everyone who has um, upgraded or become a member today. Um, and here is a slide with all of our different member levels, uh, if you are still thinking about which one you would like to do. And um, does anyone who has not contributed yet or become a monthly sustainer yet uh, want to be a general member? at uh, 25 a year, 25 a year. Uh -huh. Also, if you are a student, you can become um, a member at our student level at $10 a year, $10. Uh -huh. um, you can also give anonymously as well, or if you choose not to announce uh, your donation, you can do that as well and just write your name on the card. 
Um, so is there anyone out here today who would like to contribute any random amount? I would like to contribute the random amount of $50 to tonight. Uhuru to Jesse. Uhuru. 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 And can you say your name? Uhuru. Uh, that's ch uh, local chair Anne. Uhuru. At um, Uhuru. Reparations of a hundred tonight from Chairwoman Penny Hess. Uhuru. Uhuru, thirty incoming from Johan Beddingfield. Uhuru. Uhuru Johan. Uhuru? Yeah. Sorry? Two hundred from Jenna. Uhuru. Uhuru. Anyone else, any random amount, Uhuru? 40, Uhuru, from Jamie and Sarah, Uhuru. Uhuru? 100, and can you say your name for the live stream? Janice, Uhuru, Uhuru, 40, and can you say your name, sir? Kyle, Uhuru. 40 from Kyle, Uhuru? Great. Uhuru. Ten from Matama. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yes. Twenty-five. And can you say your name, sir? David. Uhuru. Uhuru. Just so you all know, I'm not on my phone. I'm. This is a calculator. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you how much we raised in just a moment. And, and uh, are we at? Uh, all right. Right. All right. Uhuru. <laughs> Uhuru, uhuru, uh, 15 from Rose Roby, uhuru, and did I see another hand back there? Uhuru, all right, um, anyone else, any random amount? We have, we have uh, Renee Nassar doing $40, uhuru, uhuru to Renee. Uhuru, Renee Nassar, uhuru. So our goal is 2,000 tonight. Um, do we have uh, an amount we can say we're at? Yes. So far, we in this room tonight, all of you have raised 2,020 in reparations to African people. Uhuru! 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 Uhuru. Let's keep it going. We can, we can get more. Keep all right. Keep going. Keep going. Uhuru. Uhuru. 40. And can you say your name for the live stream, please? Tessa. Uhuru, Tessa. Uhuru. Uhuru. Oh, I'm, and I'll do 20, Jackson, Uhuru. Uhuru, Jackson. Uhuru. Uhuru. Right. That's 2,080, so that's very close to 2,100. Very, very close. All right, any other random amounts? Or any... Uh, New, new members who are deciding what level they're going to be at? All right. All right. Uhuru. Uhuru. Unity through? Reparations. Unity through? Reparations. Reparations? Now. Reparations? Now. Uhuru. Any words for Jesse? Yes, Uhuru. I just want everyone to give yourselves a round of applause and salute this amazing audience tonight for that profound stance of reparations to African people. Uhuru. And if you're doing um, a card, please go to the membership table before you leave tonight um, so we can help you uh, process your um, return of reparations. Uhuru. Uhuru. Reparations now. now. Uhuru. All right. Good work. That's what you came here for, to participate in this process. Um, I just want to salute everyone who's contributed and united with the party's liberated African economy, especially the blossoming Black Power Blueprint. This is reparations in action. Next up, we have the question and answer, which will be moderated by Chairwoman Penny Hess. 
So um, if you have any questions, there is a microphone right here, and you can come um, stand in line there to ask your questions. Um, and uh, we'll have that, and then we'll have a few announcements before we close. Uh -huh. I just want to salute everybody. That was powerful. And this has been an amazing event tonight. I really want to thank Chairman O'Malley, Chatella, and everybody for coming out. We're a little bit over time, so we're just going to take two questions. If somebody, if there are two people who have a question or a discussion that they would like to raise to Chairman O'Malley, Chatella, please come over to the mic, which I think is over here. Anybody have something that they want to ask or raise? This is an opportunity to do that. All right, then. No? Okay, so I just would say we have tremendous unity in this room. Yeah. And we're going to go forward and build the Uhuru Solidarity Movement and the growing movement of white people in solidarity with African liberation and reparations to African people. You know, I just wanted to, I would just say that I appreciate the fundraising that was, um, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I just appreciate the, the fundraising and the, the uh, reparations. You know, and we always start with saying, you know, we're going to raise $2,000 tonight, and can somebody give that? And we do that because there's social wealth in the white community. And uh, many, many times from the audience that somebody has raised their hand and given that amount. So that's why we do it, because it does work. And, and you know, many times we do these online webinars. People put in $1,000 uh, then online to the Black Power Blueprint. And even, you know, years ago in Oakland, when the African People's Socialist Party was in Oakland, there was a man, a homeless man, white man, who came to all of our events and we would always have food and, you know, he would always eat dinner there and he would always support, he was a tremendous supporter. And he, but he never had any money because, you know, he lived on a couch on the Berkeley Pier. And, you know, he always said though, one of these days, I'm gonna get my inheritance. And um, actually, we didn't see him for a while. And then um, a month or so later, in, in the, uh, uh, two money orders for $500 each came that he sent to the Uhuru movement. And it turns out that he, he, you know, he was from a wealthy family on the East Coast. He'd actually gone to Harvard, but he had the social contradictions that, that many white people have. And so you know, the social wealth is there. And that's why we raised this and the things that we're saying about what it means to be a sustainer of this organization, to um, just take a little bit out of your, automatically out of your bank account every month and have it go towards reparations and to the work of the African People's Socialist Party for political and economic power to African people and as a stand of reparations. So, you know, I just saluted and to those who have participated in it here tonight. So, if there are no questions, I appreciate the unity that's here in this room. I think this has been a powerful event. Again, I salute the Uhuru Solidarity Movement for all the tremendous work that they've done. And I think Anne has some announcements mm -hmm. that she wants to raise. Uhuru. Okay, so um, it's listed on here Sunday rallies. Okay, so uh, from three to five here at the Uhuru House um, are the Sunday rallies. Um, and then every Monday, um, the Huru Solidarity Movement has our open meeting um, at the Panera Bread, 1908 4th Street North, from 6 to 8. We are looking for our own spot, a storefront. So if you know someone who has an inexpensive storefront or who would like to contribute a storefront to the Huru Solidarity Movement, we are looking for that. Uh, but in the meantime, we're meeting at Panera Bread at um, 6 to 8 every Monday the one on 4th Street across from Sunken Gardens. Um, and USM also hosts monthly webinars to continue to raise reparations to the Black Power Blueprint. On October 30th, you can check our YouTube or Facebook page for the next one. Uh, Chairwoman Penny will be speaking on overturning the culture of sexual violence. 
And then on November 3rd and 4th in Washington, D.C., you can join the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations for the ninth annual March on the White House. This year it is themed, There is no Peace, Africa and Africans are at War. This is a, there is a bus going from St. from, is there a bus going from St. Petersburg? Okay, so um, you can uh, travel there yourself. It's well worth it, and to get there November 3rd and 4th. Okay, now Jesse is going to come up to talk about Giving Tuesday. Before you go, Anne, if you could come back for a second. Before I make this announcement, I just wanted to, on behalf of the members of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement here in St. Petersburg, wish our comrade and fearless leader of USM St. Pete and the Southeast region a happy belated birthday. And you, um, you can do like I did. I did a birthday fundraiser. And we raised $450 toward the Black Power Blueprint. So you can do that too. And in appreciation for you, Anne, here is a card from the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Uhuru. All right. So um, I'm just going to make a quick announcement about a great program that is happening right now that all of us should be a part of that's called Giving Tuesday. Anne Hirsch just mentioned that one of the things the Uhuru Movement is doing now is this thing with uh, Facebook birthday fundraisers, where on your birthday you can just set up this fundraiser. It's really easy. And call on your friends and family, instead of giving me a gift of some personal thing, give the gift of supporting black self-determination and reparations to African people. And similar to that is a program called Giving Tuesday, which is a way, an easy way for anyone who has the ability to create some social media account to support African self-determination. So we're calling on everyone here to host a fundraiser on Facebook or offline. Actually, I'm gonna correct myself, you don't even need a social media account. So if you hate Facebook, you can still do this. You can still do Giving Tuesday for the Black Power Blueprint. Giving Tuesday is this thing, it's supposed to be like for supporting charities and stuff like that. But of course, the genius of the Uhuru movement is to take up all political space and turn it into a space for reparations and African liberation. So this is a program, it's very easy to do. We have flyers at the sign-in table that show you how to sign up. You will get a tutorial, a toolkit, and a short mobilizing video to share with people that shows everyone what the Black Power Blueprint programs are. Giving Tuesday is officially November 27th, but we're starting as early as November 20th and keeping it going through December 7th. And thousands of other people will unite with reparations to African people, and it's easy. We just reach out to our friends and family. We create this little thing on Facebook that goes out and calls on people to donate, and it goes directly towards the African People's Education and Defense Fund. You make a personal goal that you call on people to support, and the donations are tax deductible to the nonprofit APEDF, and that is a really exciting program that's coming up. And it's, we just want everybody to do it, everybody that has anything to do with this movement to do Giving Tuesday. So raise your hand if you are not going to do Giving Tuesday. Okay. So because of that, we are now considering the sign-in sheet for this event, a sign-up for Giving Tuesday. And you can expect an email or a call from us uh, on how to get your Giving Tuesday fundraiser set up. So thank you, everybody. Uhuru. Let me turn it back over to Anne. Um, could I, I think now um, I'm going to call up Janice Kant to tell us about Uhuru Foods and Pies. Uhuru. Um, I am also a member of the African People's Solidarity Committee and I have the honor of coordinating the St. Petersburg um, Uhuru Foods and Pies, which is a 30-some year institution of the Uhuru movement to raise uh, reparations and to build an independent African economy. So I invite you to one, uh, take home some of these delicious fresh baked pies that our baker uh, Tamara made t today, this afternoon. Please take, uh, come back and take them home. We have the six inch uh, personal pies in every flavor. They are $10. 
um, and come back and get a pie seller packet so that you can sell Uhuru pies to your friends and family. You can have a pie tasting at your office or your school. We, did, we had a pie party at the Gibbs High School um, Multicultural Club that was just uh, recently. We really appreciate the support. Um, and uh, fill out one of these that says uh, how you'd like to volunteer. You can bake and box and label pies. You can um, do phone banking to get orders from previous buyers. You can help promote on social media and also uh, help us sell on Saturdays at the Saturday morning market at our booth or at other um, pop-ups that we have around. So I really encourage everyone to take them home. It's a great way, it's a very broad way. A lot of people uh, can support the Uhuru movement. And, and we have our campaign for 10,000 Uhuru pies for the Black Power Blueprint for this fall. Uhuru. All right, and the last announcement is that the Huru Solidarity Movement plans to have our yearly convention in, um, in 2019 in April. It will be at St. Louis. If you go there, you'll get, and get to see the Black Power Blueprint and uh, tour those facilities. So we want you to keep your ears and eyes open for uh, um, announcements by email and other ways about that. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Appreciate uh, Chairman Amalia Shetela. Thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, Chairwoman Penny Hess, thank you. And Jesse Neville, thank you very much. Um, unity through. Reparation. Unity through. Reparation. Re Uhuru. Uhuru.